Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Today's guest in episode 23 is Anne Summers. The fact that I need to use five adjectives to accurately describe her role in Australian writing culture speaks volumes about Anne's impact, influence and ability. To my knowledge, she is the first guest of penmanship to appear on an Australian postage stamp as part of a series celebrating Australian legends in 2011. Her career began with the publication of an ambitious and controversial book named Damned Whores and God's Police in 1975. Anne has written eight books so far, but it's the updated 2016 edition of that first title which brings her to Brisbane in late April for an event at Avid Reader Bookstore. Before the 40th anniversary book launch at Avid, I met Anne at her hotel room in South Brisbane for a conversation which touches on how she became a contributing writer to Australian newspapers and radio while still a child, the difficult and lengthy process of writing Damned Whores and God's Police how she made the transition from journalism to working in politics as an advisor to a prime minister in the 1990s, what makes a great magazine profile, and how she decided to launch her online magazine Anne Summers Reports after a disagreement with an editor at a major Australian magazine. Introducing Anne Summers, author, journalist, editor, publisher and columnist. Summers, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. What are you doing here in Brisbane? Uh, I'm here to speak at the Avid Reader Bookshop. Um, there's an event there this evening uh, around my the reissue of my first book, Damned Whores and God's Police, which was published first in 1975 and is uh, republished uh, in its four, fourth or fifth edition depending on whether you include the e-version or not, mm-hmm. but certainly the fourth um, print version of the book uh, in March uh, this year by New South Publishing. So it's a, um, a wonderful um, honour to be doing it, and um, I'm very pleased that um, bookshops around the country and libraries are wanting me to come and talk about it. It must be quite an honour to have a book that has had such a long shelf life with many reissues and uh, rebrandings, as it were. There's a lovely photograph of you from around the time of publication, I suppose, on the, on the cover of the, the reissue. Yeah, what is it like to have a book that exists? Well, that's the, for... the photograph on the cover was actually taken in 1974 uh, by a very fam- person who became very famous, Carol Jerrams, and who unfortunately died a few years later. Mm. Um, so it was taken while I was writing the book, so that makes it very special uh, because it was at a time when I wasn't sure that I would ever actually be able to finish writing it. So I think the photograph in some ways reflects my, um, not just my apprehension uh, and, and fe- very very real fear that I'd be able to do it, uh, but it just captures something of my, you know, the tentative nature of, of what I was, of who I was back then. Uh, but it is an extraordinary thing um, and something that I'm very, very um, proud of and pleased about, of course, that the book has... It, it hasn't been in print all that time. It actually went out of print in 19... In, in, sorry, in 2008. Um, so it was out of print for eight years until this year. Mm. Though during that time I published a, an e-book version of it, which sold quite well. But it's... Um, it's obviously something that I never thought would happen and it's interesting that there is now a real resurgence of feminism happening uh, both in Australia and around the world I'd I'd argue Mm. and so there's an audience for the book uh, that there probably wouldn't have been 10 years ago. Yeah. Was it a difficult book to write? What what were the origins of the first text? Oh, it was an unbelievably hard book to write. I mean, it was my first book so I was was having to... um, test myself as to whether I could actually write a book and it was a, a very big book I mean I just I, I it started off as a small book it started off I was I originally proposed to the publisher who is John Hooker from Penguin Books uh, I originally proposed the idea of a book about women and mateship and uh, you know why it was that mateship seemed to be such a barrier to women being included in Australian society uh, but once I got into it and started doing the research and, and um, 
it seemed to me that that wasn't a sufficiently big question, so the the book grew. And what it what it required me to do, which was quite a terrifying thing for when I was twenty seven when I started writing it, uh, so I was quite a young person. Um, that I was going to have to take on, you know, the grand old men, and they were all men, of course, of Australian history and Australian literature, because I was basically took them all on and said that, you know, what they had done uh, in the way they told the Australian story to date was, um, well, we didn't use the word sexist so much back then, more, more chauvinist was the word we used, uh, but the, the, their accounts of, um, particularly historians, their accounts of Australia either completely excluded women and that most of them did or or where they did include women um, it was only in the most you know subservient roles and their women's participation was never um, never questioned and never never explored from any kind of um, critical point of view mm. it began as an academic um, origin is that correct? Like you received, well, you received not, a scholarship. Sort well, of thing, sort of, sort of. Um, I mean, what happened is that I was um, studying at the University of Sydney in the Department of Government, and I did have a Commonwealth scholarship to, or postgraduate scholarship to do a PhD. And my supervisor was Professor Henry Mayer, and he was a, a political uh, philosopher, and he was. Um, you know, he was, I don't know, do you know the De Niro story? He was yeah. a De Niro boy. He was one of the German Jews who uh, was um, living in London in 1938, 39, and um, escaped from England on a ship called the De Niro, D-U-N-E-R-A. It's a very famous book by uh, Cyril Pearl about, about the De Niro scandal. There's also been a film about it. And, um, but it, the, the ship comprised of several hundred um, Jewish, mostly German, um, young men um, who were shipped from Britain to Australia, treated appallingly badly, uh, and when they got here weren't welcome at all, and they were eventually allowed to land and they were all put into detention, in mostly in Hay, and some of them in a place called, I think, Togabilla in uh, Victoria. So but the, the, this group of men contained some of the most brilliant people who have ever come to this country, and many scientists, um, um, historians, um, all kinds of... I could give you the names, they probably don't mean much anymore, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But anyway, Henry Mayer was one of them. So he, he was a fantastic person, to, and he's, I owe him so much in terms of his encouraging me to write about um, the women's movement, to write about this new kind of liberation movement that you know everybody else said, well, you know, don't be stupid, you write something, if you write your PhD on women, that'll ruin your career, there'll be no future in it and he took the opposite view he also took the view that um, when he heard that that penguin had given me a book contract that there were more than enough phds gathering dust in libraries and i should put all my effort into writing the book mm. so that's what i did rather than doing the phd um, and his only um, request was that, that once the book was finished that i uh, then try and turn it into a phd and try and get it uh, and which is what we did and um, that took some doing because the title was a real turn off for the university yeah. and Sydney University at one point said that they would accept it um, but would but they wouldn't accept the published book even though there was a hardcover book um, so they wanted me to retype the whole thing and uh, give it a different title retype the whole thing as in on a typewriter yeah of course yeah uh, so it was a proper proper you know manuscript yeah. type of PhD and um, and give it a you know a, a more less inflammatory title, huh. so we said no to that. Anyway, eventually I <laughs> came round, and I eventually get a PhD for the book. Uh, as it was, uh, all, all I had to do was to do a bit of additional. Work. I had to write some some essays on on historiography or whatever, a few other things to fulfil the requirements for the degree. What else was going on in your life at that time when you were writing that book? Was it your sole focus? Were you having to juggle work in other spheres? Uh, it certainly wasn't my sole focus. I was very politically active at the time um, in in the um, you know, embryonic women's movement, and uh, the Sydney women's movement was a, one of great um, sort of activism. We uh, I was very involved in the establishment of the first women's refuge, uh, LC, in Australia, in 1974. 
and uh, later that same year the Sydney Rape Crisis Centre um, and you know there was just a lot, huge amount going on we were publishing magazines and newspapers and having um, you know what we used to call teach-ins and speak outs and all kinds of events I think I was also doing a bit of postgraduate teaching um, and um, you know trying to um, also make my way as a journalist so I was trying I was writing wherever I could get freelance assignments um, and I used to write a little bit for the National Times and also for the Bulletin so I was very busy. What was uh, the engine that drove you to pursue writing and journalism as a career? Where did that interest come from? Um, it's very hard to say where it came from it's something I, that I've always had and always wanted to um, t- I'd always I mean the two things I wanted to do is write a book and be a journalist and I was very lucky in 1975, both those things happened. Yeah. I published my book and I got my first job as a journalist uh, when I was taken on by the National Times in, um, in December 1975, which was about a month after the book was published. And uh, it's, it's very hard to say where it came from, it's just something I've always wanted to do. Were you the kind of child who was voraciously consuming books and... And writing, yeah. Excelling to... in school and oh. the English type subjects and that sort of thing? Um, yeah, I, I was... I, Yes, it's up to a point. I, I hated school and I didn't really do much. I did as little as possible at school. I couldn't wait to leave and I left as soon as I was legally able. Mm. Um, but I certainly um, used to like writing and I used to do a lot of writing as a child. I used to write short stories and books and things. And there used to be back then the um, newspaper and also the Catholic newspaper, and we, which we used to get, both had um, children's pages which were very, um, and there was also on the ABC a show called The Argonauts that uh, encouraged children to contribute, and I contributed to all of them. Mm. So I was you know, writing you know, pretty much all the time for, for these three different things, all of which, well, The Argonauts I think came, was every day, and the, um, the children's pages in the newspapers were once a week. So I would write short stories and other sorts of contributions for them. Did your parents encourage your interest in writing? Um, I don't think they discouraged it. I mean, but, but both my family, are, they are a family of readers. Um, they're not, you know, terrifically well educated, but they believed in reading, certainly on my mother's side, and um, there, there were always books in the house. And uh, so it wasn't something that they, um, you know, disapproved of. And what was interesting, one thing I found out many years later is that my... Uh, I think it's grandfather, no, not grandfather, maybe great-grandfather. Anyway, somebody on my father's side uh, back in England had been a journalist and so the seems to run in the family a bit. Mm. But I didn't know that growing up. Yeah. What was the pathway into journalism generally at that time? You mentioned you wrote a book and presumably got offered a job as a result. But uh, how did journalism... No. Oh, God, no. no. Um, you don't get offered jobs. Um <laughs> Uh, well, well, what happened is, I mean, I certainly wanted to work as a journalist, and I was used to go. I went when I first moved to Sydney, uh, which was in about 1971, I think. Um, I went, did the rounds of all the the editors and all you know the, all the newspapers, all the magazines, and and asked for work. And uh, I used to get a bit of freelance work. I remember the person who was a literary editor of the Bulletin. Um, gave me some some work reviewing books and the guy who was the editor of the National Times the only guy called Trevor Kennedy he um, gave me some writing assignments I mean they weren't terribly interesting but at least I got my foot in the door and then um, in late 75 and it was around about the time the book came out there were two things happened one is that the um, National Times picked up my book and decided to really promote it very heavily and they actually ran the cover of the book as a full-page front cover of the newspaper, hmm. which was, you know, phenomenal and, yeah. and uh, certainly put me and the book on the map. Um, and around about the same time, they advertised for um, for what they called self, uh, energetic self-starters and it was unheard of for journalism jobs to be advertised. But there was a new editor by then, a guy called Max Such, S-U-I-C-H, um, who was interested in expanding the sort of t- pool of talent and uh, so I, I went for one of these jobs and he um, was very uninterested in me at first because I came from Sydney University and he said he didn't want any fucking academics on the paper. <laughs> I assured him I wasn't a fucking academic. <laughs> and fortunately I did know a couple of people who were on the staff and they put in a word for me. So he took me on on three months probation. 
and uh, anyway, I, I did very well, and he um, kept me on. You must have been reasonably confident in your abilities to front up at a bunch of newspapers and say, I think I'm good, give me some work. I must have. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I certainly did it, yeah. Was there much of a freelance market or culture at that time? Yes, there was, yeah. And, I mean, I remember there was a... Um, the Australian, which was a very different paper back then, it was a very liberal and very... Um, it was relatively... I think the Australian started in 1964, so it been going there for about 10 years. But it was very unlike today's paper. But, it, but they um, had decided they wanted to have a column, a regular column, regular weekly column, by a young woman, or two young women, or I think alternating once a week. And um, you know, I heard about this, and I, you know, I tried out for it, and unfortunately, I didn't get it. Uh, somebody else I knew got it, which was, I was very disappointed. But there were, you know, the fact that you could actually do that was great, and um, you know, you could certainly go and ask for work, and people, they, you can still do that, mm. still do that, for sure. Yeah. It's a bit harder these days because the nature of the industry has changed a lot, and. Um, but uh, you know, in fact, probably freelancers have had a better time because they pay, they cost less than full-time journalists. Mm-hmm. Yes. How did your first book come to be on the cover of the National Times? Is, is that correct? National yeah, Times? National Times. What was the link there? Did they contact you directly, the publisher? Nothing to do with me. I had no, I had no idea. I mean, so they just they got the book and they, they thought it was an important book. And they, um, you know, it was an editorial decision on their part to do it. I had no idea. So it wasn't a profile of you? As no, God, no, no, no. no. Hmm. I, I, I don't think I was even, I wasn't even interviewed. I think they just ran an excerpt. Wow. Did that change your career in any noticeable way besides the fact that you could front up to places and maybe bring along a copy of the magazine or the newspaper and say, this is me? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's nothing, the f- publishing a book changes everything, absolutely everything. And like publishing that book... Um, was a huge deal and it really changed everything for me because it really put me on the map. Uh, the fact that it was um, such a contentious book and that it was such a brave book and it was a book that was really re- ready to take on uh, the um, the world, I guess, take on Australian so- society. Um, people, you know, I, mean, I noticed the first time I went, you know, I used to go to the pub every Friday night to the Push Pub and, you know, a lot of people there that were wouldn't have deigned to speak to me because I was just too young and green. Um, you mm. know, the attitude changed radically once the book came out. I was treated very differently. You were taken more seriously? Well, I, well, first of all, my existence was noticed. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that was, that was something. Um, yeah, certainly I was somebody that people would, would talk to from, from then on. And uh, so the book the book is was the thing, and that changed everything for me. And I think the fact that the, you know, the book got a huge amount of publicity everywhere. I mean, it got got reviewed everywhere, and there were a lot of articles about it. It really was very heavily promoted, um, you know, by those in, in, by those even by today's standards. I think it was it was they did an incredible job promoting it. That must have been gratifying because you've mentioned it was a hard book to write. Yeah. Um, did you kind of revel in your own brilliance for a while, or did you were you immediately on to the next thing, or? Um, no, I wasn't, I, because I got the job at the Times very soon after the book came out. In fact, while I was, I think I'd only just finished doing the publicity and I, I had flown around Australia and done some promoting of the book. Hmm. Um, they, I remember being, I remember I was the, the TAA Traveller of the Month. <laughs> TAA was the... Airline. Airline, Trans-Australian Airlines, the forerunner of Qantas. Um, and they used to have a magazine. They had a photograph of me. It was you know the TAA Traveller of the Month. So they flew me to Perth for, to do a whole lot of events to promote the book. So mm. That was pretty amazing back then. Mm. Um, but once I got my job as a journalist, I mean I had intended to write another book straight away, but it turned out to be impossible because the um, you know, the, jo- the job was so so absorbing and, and there was simply wasn't time. What kind of reporting were you doing at that time? Well, I did a lot of. Um, it's interesting. I'm just writing about this at the moment for my next, my current book, which mm-hmm. is a, a memoir, autobiography, <laughs> and so, so it's all fresh in your mind. It, it is actually. <laughs> yes, um, I worked there for four years, I think, and 
you know, you need to know about the National Times. It was a very special paper. It was very unusual in Australia. Please give more context. Very unusual in Fairfax. Um, it was a new. It, it was a. It was, it was, I guess, what you'd call a magazine-style newspaper, and there was it was the only one of its kind to exist within the mainstream media. It was owned by Fairfax, and Fairfax also published the Sydney Morning Herald. And I guess the difference between, say, the Sydney Morning Herald, where you know there were no bylines in the Sydney Morning Herald, for example. Really, um, it was unusual in those days for journalists to get bylines. The story would be from our Canberra bureau or wow. by a special correspondent or. That is bizarre to hear that. Very unusual. Yeah. It was a very conservative paper. There were so many subjects they wouldn't talk about. I mean, the words pregnant and virgin could not be used in the, in the Herald hmm. um, and many lots of other words, I'm sure. Um, so the National Times came along and it was, it was sort of the new journalism. It was willing to write about anything at great length. We all got bylines and uh, we were encouraged to write about subjects that the rest of the media didn't cover. And I became famous for a number of things that I did. Um, but in my first year, I won a Walkley Award for a series of six articles I did on New South Wales prisons. It's not a very you know, sexy subject, but I was able to uh, uncover stuff that had never been reported before, uh, such as the fact that there'd been a riot at Bathurst Prison and the prisons had, had burnt down the jail. And uh, that stuff was never reported back then, so nobody knew about it, or they, they were rumours, but nobody really knew. And I was able to confirm that not only had that happened, but that a prisoner had been shot in the back and left um, a paraplegic. Mm. And I found this guy, and everyone said he didn't exist. I found him in a nursing home in Maroubra somewhere. Um, I also was able to pro prove a whole lot of things. So there were six articles altogether, and they caused, led to a Royal Commission. Big into the features, like multiple thousand words. Oh, yeah, articles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, huge. Mm. Um, so that got, kind of really got my name made. And then in the second year, I, I mean, I, did, I used to do big stories almost every week, and unless I was, for example, the prison story, and then another series I did on defence, you know, I might be given three months to do it because it was a big investigation. But there was another story I did, uh, there were two actually that, that, that I became very well known for and these were group journalism exercises where I would work with a couple of guys and the first one, um, which was absolutely, I can't, probably in some ways changed journalism, I'm not saying that in a boastful way but just in a you know, factual way, mm. and this was in uh, late 1976, so I'd probably been in the job about a year. I went with two two of my male colleagues. We went up to um, Ingham in North Farm of Queensland and we had heard this unbelievable story and we, um, the three of us went up there and we went to Townsville, we drove in, we hit that town, uh, we got the story and got out of town in one day. And the story was how the young girls of that town were systematically raped uh, by the by the boys in the town really? and our story was called how we, and they used to call it a train so the, the boys did a bit of dance or at the pub and what, one of the boys would go chug chug like this and that would be say the train is on so they'd grab the girls take them out of the cane fields and rape them and every girl in the town this was done to and they couldn't the police did nothing huh. the parents couldn't complain and we were able to to, to get even in that one day we were able to get the evidence I got the girls to talk to me and tell me mm. um, that my colleagues talked to the men talked to the police so this story I think it ran to about six full pages of the paper and it was called How Women Are Trained and um, you know there have been films made. It's, it's huge absolutely huge mm. and then a couple of years later with David Marr who you know was a colleague at, for a time at the National Times as well and of course is now very famous on television and what have you he and I did another joint story, which was also on a rape, and this was a time it was at St. Paul's College at Sydney University, and it was called the Animal Act of the Year, and it was about how uh, the St. Paul's boys had had their annual dinner and every black tie dinner were at the end of the year, and they all you know, give out various awards, and one of the awards that they gave was the Animal Act of the Year, like the worst thing that somebody had done, and it was for having um, had sex with this girl who was unconscious, at women's college and um, so I did the girls story and David did the boys story and again it was a conflicting well it was a different sort of story because in, in this case the, the boys contested it and the, the woman um, you know she gave me a stat deck and everything as to what had happened mm. 
But it was the kind of journalism that no one was doing back then. So it mm. was really um, exciting and interesting and um, totally absorbing and didn't, didn't leave time for doing anything else. <laughs> yeah, that is extraordinary. Yeah. So the National Times uh, encouraged its writers to have their own voices yes, and yes. styles rather yes. than the no byline sort of approach. Absolutely, yes. Completely different from anywhere the rest of the media. Yeah. You, you mentioned new journalism um, yep. were you a student of that form or were there writers that you were particularly fond of in that style who... oh well I mean when we did, obviously we read Tom Wolfe and, and saw what he was doing um, and I guess the, um, the the lesson we learnt was that it was that any subject was um, you know, was was permissible you could write about anything and you could write about it uh, you didn't have to be um, distance and objective and in the way that you you did for the other newspapers and um, you could bring yourself into the story and um, and you know you could be very um, very descriptive and 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 um, and you could sort of go into the psychology of the pe- person you're writing about I mean one of the um, first pieces of, of most famous piece of new journalism was a piece by Tom Wolfe that was published in New York magazine called um, um, I think it was called Radical Chic, and it was an account of a cocktail party at Leonard Bernstein's apartment uh, for, to honour the Black Panthers. Mm. You know, they hear all these guys who, you know, committed um, robberies and murders and what have you, being honoured by Cram de la Cram of New York society, New York liberal Jewish society, mm. and um, Tom Wolfe, um, you know, mercilessly parodied at the same time as he explored what it was with Leonard Bernstein, you know, a very famous composer, what was it in his psyche that made him want to host this party? And it was, you know, absolutely... Well, that was a piece that did change journalism. Mm. It was great. So you were attracted to that style where you were a character in the story, essentially, and you were reacting to what people were telling you? Sometimes. I mean, I think what what... what New Journalist Nib was it kind of opened things up and, and it gave you the opportunity to um, sort of decide how to approach a story. I mean, obviously, when I did my prison series, I didn't put myself into it. I was straight reporting and that was just, you know, just getting the story, getting people on the record to talk about things that everybody had said just didn't exist or hadn't happened. So that was a very different kind of reporting so basically, you you chose the form that was appropriate to the story that you were telling. Mm. What was the uh, the germ of the idea behind that prison series? Did you get a tip off from someone, or did you get her to say, "Go check this out"? Or? I can't remember. <laughs> fair, fair answer. Can't remember. Uh, but uh, you know, I, it, it it would have been um, you know stuff that people were talking about, and and I mean, one of the things that was very interesting at the time, and I'm in fact trying to write about this, is that. Having people like me, and I certainly wasn't the only only one, there were quite a few of us, but people who had been political activists um, rather than having come up through the cadet system as journalists, so coming in sort of at a, being laterally recruited into journalism, we bought not just knowledge and sensibility but also contacts and knowledge that, that other journalists didn't have. And so like the, the traditional police reporters, you know, all these contacts with the cops, you know, I went to a few of their briefings, you know, they go and have their first briefing at you know, seven o'clock every morning and they'd be having a few whiskeys with their coffee when the cops would be telling them what to write. Mm. And that was basically it. Um, whereas, you know, I'd, be, I'd been involved in the prison movement, I'd been involved in you know, the squatting movement, I'd been arrested lots of times. So, I mean, I knew a different world. And uh, so when you know, went, went to go and write about the prisons, I knew all the lawyers who represented these prisoners. So, mm. I mean, I, all these stories were gettable if you knew how to, how to find, if you knew the people to go to. And then once you knew the story, well, then you'd have to go out and confirm it. I mean, I used to do a lot of literally knocking on doors and turning up at people's places at night and just, you know, barging in and getting them to talk to me. Mm. And sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they wouldn't. What was your strike rate like? Pretty good, yeah. Because I was so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to have been attracted to untold stories. Is that a fair some fair statement? Um, stories that yes, have been told elsewhere. Yeah, I've all, I mean, I've always uh, and still am interested, and that's one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment with my new publication: um, stories that that other people aren't telling or aren't telling 
adequately and uh, I you know I'm, I'm very um, you know have a great curiosity about society and about the world and so I think that one of the things that journalism should be doing is telling these stories and uh, that's been certainly one thing that motivates me. Mm. You seem to have made quite a large impact fairly early on in your career. What was the aspiration? Where did you see yourself going in journalism, in Australian media? Not something I gave it two seconds thought to. (laughs) I just was doing it and enjoying it Mm. and seeing what happened next. Well, uh, let's let's move on from the National Times then. Uh, You moved on to, I think, was it uh, Ms. Magazine or was it Good Weekend somewhere in there? Oh, no, no. Well, lots of things, steps in between. Um, I went from um, the National Times to the United States for, for six months on a journalist scholarship, which um, was very interesting because it, it was a um, time where I started to sort of look differently at the United States. And um, I was the first person I knew to ever go to America. Mm-hmm. And most of us wouldn't go there because we hated America so much mm. uh, because of the war mm. um, and because of racism and so many things. But but. We were starting to realise, well, of all the bad things about America, there are also a lot of good things about America, including a lot of wonderful writers and a lot of journalists who who we we followed. So, uh, mm. I, I did that for six months. Then I came back to Canberra. I was appointed the bureau chief of the Australian Financial Review. So I worked there, I worked there for five years. Big job in the Canberra Press Gallery. Yeah, that yeah. was that. And so I covered um, part of the um, Fraser government, and I did that job up until. Um, just after the election of the Hawke government in 1983 and then later that year I left journalism and went to the bureaucracy and ran the Office of the Status of Women for three years. Um, Then after that I was recruited back by Fairfax and sent to New York. Uh, That was the only way they could get me back was to offer me (laughs) New York which was um, a great jewel. Mm. Um, So I went and ran the New York office for them and I used to write columns for the Fin Review and, and for the National Times, which was still limping along then. And it was while I was, th- I went back to New York in 1986. I mean, I went to New York in 1986 and the opportunity to buy Ms. Magazine uh, arose in 1987 and um, Fairfax was persuaded to buy it and I became the editor-in-chief and then um, a few months later in early 1988 when the whole takeover of Fairfax by young Morick Fairfax and the whole stock market crash and that whole huge story meant that they sold Ms and Sassy, the two magazines in in New York and Sandra Yates and I, um, we we did a management buyout and we bought the two magazines ourselves so we then took them over and, and ran them. I was still the editor of, of Ms, uh, but I was also the vice president of this little company called Matilda Publications. Mm. Great name. That ran them, yes. <laughs> and um, so that was next for the next few years until we were, that's a whole other story about how we were driven out of business. Mm-hmm. And then I came back to Australia. I stayed in New York for several years to, trying to break into the freelance market there. Oh, let's uh, pause on that for a moment. Um, mm. What... What were the kind of publications you wanted to see your byline in and how hard was it to get well, there? Well, New York Times was, was my holy grail um, and I never made it. Mm. And for, I tried it a lot. I used to send a lot of pieces in and I, and I was um, given very encouraging responses, but I never quite got it got there. I think if I'd stayed in New York, I would have made it. Um, I was getting very close. I was starting to write op-eds. I was publishing the New York Daily News and... I used to send my pieces out to paper, newspapers all around America and a lot of them used to pick them up. So I, mm. you know, I was starting to make some progress, but it was, it was you, know, you certainly couldn't didn't make any money out of it. it, was, mm. it was, and I was also trying to do a book. Mm. It was hard going, but um, uh, then I got the phone call from Paul Keating's office and offering me the chance to, I was asking me if I'd come back and work for him for a while to um, help him. And that was kind of irresistible, so I, I went back to I went to Canberra and went and worked for him for 11 months. Mm. And then when he unexpectedly won the 93 election, um, and I had always expected I would go back to New York, uh, but I started to have second thoughts about Australia because he'd won and the country was going to be transformed, so we thought. <laughs> and so I managed to persuade my partner to... Um, to move from New York to Sydney, and uh, that's when I took the job as Good Weekend Editor. So mm-hmm. that was in 93. 
All right, let's backtrack a little. Uh, you're a political reporter for five years in Canberra. Yes. Did you enjoy being in that kind of uh, close knit world in the press gallery and covering politicians from up close? Yeah, that no, no, was fantastic. It was, um, you know, it was a very different from from what I'd done before, and and but it was. I mean, I guess I'd always been interested in politics. Um, you know, first of all, as an activist, and, um, um, and and here was a chance to to look at politics very close up from a different point of view and a different sort of politics, sort of federal politics. And um, you know, working for a paper that um, you know had a tremendous reputation, and you got treated even though I was very green, and, very, mm-hmm. and I'm very lucky to have got that job. But I, they took a big chance on me, mm. and. Um, it was fantastic. I mean, to be running, going, I'd never, two, th- three things that were different. One was I'd never worked in Canberra. Secondly, I'd never worked on a daily paper. And thirdly, I'd never covered politics. So I'm not, <laughs> I'd done a few political stories for the National Times, but never covered politics like this. Um, so it was a huge step up for me. Um, I used to have a weekly column, you know, a very long weekly column called Canberra Observed, which always used to run off the front page, which mm. they, they don't do that anymore. But it was, um, you know, the summing up of the week, and they, you know, I could write five thousand words. They didn't care. It, it was, it was. Wow. <laughs> those are the days. Yeah. How are you? I mean, this seems like an obscene amount of work. How are you uh, balancing work and life, or was work your life at that time? Oh, it was totally my life. I didn't know anything else. I mean. I'd, <laughs> You go. To, I mean, you get to work probably around ten in the morning, leave around midnight, and then so, you come yep. back in the morning and do it all again. Yep, ten in my life. But uh, it didn't really bother me. But for after a few years, it did, and I mean that's why I, um, when I left Keating's office, I didn't really want to go back to newspapers because I just that, I was thinking oh, it's time I do want a life. You know, I do want to actually be able to go home and go out to dinner with people and you know go home at night and 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 not have to work till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock every night. So that, that was one of the reasons why I chose Good Weekend as a job. A lot of people thought that was a surprising choice for me. Hmm. Um, but the press gallery was, was fine, um, but I don't know that I'd want to have done it forever uh, just because it meant you have no opportunities to have a social life. Yeah. Was there a hesitation in transitioning from being a reporter to working in politics? Um, yes, um, yeah, of course there was. I mean, I, I worried about whether or not I was kind of cutting myself off from from journalism, uh, from future opportunities in journalism. Um, and I was enjoying it. I was doing really well. And I'd just been elected president of the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery, the first mm. woman to ever be elected. And things were going really, really well. Mm. Um, so it was a very big decision. But on the other hand, it was an extraordinary opportunity to go and work at you know, a very high level job in the Prime Minister's department and have a chance to sort of put my money where my mouth, my mouth where my money was, if you like, in <laughs> terms of having a chance to influence policy on women. And, and that was an, you know, an area of interest of mine had been for forever. Yeah. So um, I kind of found it irresistible. I remember talking to Max Walsh, who was my editor, and the person who had recruited me to the Fin Review and, and um, asked him what he thought. I mean, he didn't really want me to leave, but he also said, well, you know, it'll look good on your CV. Mm. So I did it. Paint me a picture of Good Weekend magazine at the time when you became editor. Is it vastly different to how it is today? Oh, Which is yeah. how I know it, obviously. Yes. Um, I think what's different, well, it's, it's, it's hard to... Um, compare and first of all it looked different it was a different format you know, it was a small format uh, the same size as the Ausmag is now um, and it was on glossy paper mm-hmm. and so uh, photographs looked a lot better so it's very very muddy now I don't like that that matte paper that they use um, but I guess that, and we had star fighters we had six star fighters which is a you know, luxury that I don't have anymore mm. and very good writers so and we had a tradition of, um, although I inherited it, I mean, I didn't create it, but it was already there, but I was lucky to, to, to walk into a place that had a tradition of of um, doing really interesting profiles and really interesting feature pieces. We had two full-time staff photographers, which was also an incredible mm. luxury. 
so we could do really big extravagant pieces and um you know and spend a fair bit of money on them which is was something that i don't think they do today no and um, we also had um a lot of i think today advertising has a lot more sway on on what's written and that certainly wasn't the case in my day so when you were editor uh the editor ad sorry advertising and editorial departments were completely different and you kind of had no interest and in vice versa or you were well not completely i mean i'd also i mean i'd been a magazine proprietor myself and, and i had a very strong and i also wanted you know to keep my job and if, if, if Good Weekend wasn't doing well and we weren't getting ads, well, that would have been a problem. So I wasn't completely... I wasn't one of these editors who refuses to have anything to do with the business side. Mm. Uh, but I didn't... Um, I didn't have to run my stories past them or anything like that. And I, I was always kept in contact with the advertising manager and I would also always, um, you know... You know, be, be, if they wanted to do some special promotion or something, I'd be open to that, and I'd be open to discussing you know where we placed ads. But they didn't get to dictate what we could and couldn't run. Hmm. Mm. What did you see as the role of Good Weekend at that time? Was it described to you by someone at Fairfax as X, or did you come up with your own uh, idea for what it it's, should represent on a weekly basis? Um, a good question. I can't really remember. I mean, I'm sure I was hired by a guy called Michael Hoy, who was the editorial director of Fairfax then. This was when Conrad Black owned Fairfax. And, um, you know, I'm sure we did have a conversation, but I can't remember what, what it was. And I think my job was really to, um, you know, to, to bring some quality, I mean, to, or to maintain, but mm. to improve. The, it was always seen as a, as a good quality publication. Um, but with my magazine experience from New York, um they expected that I would um you know maintain the quality and improve it and try and come up with you know really good good story ideas, which is what I tried to do and you know we used to, we used to be very very creative and very um we used to have a lot of fun doing doing crazy things nowadays it's rare to see a story longer than about four thousand words in good weekends I know. what were you working with at the time at like the upper limit of word count. Well, I remember I devoted an entire issue once to one story. Really? It was a reprint. <laughs> and that really was insane. But, um, <laughs> Which story? Well, it was a story um, that I reprinted from, I think it was from the Village Voice, and it was about a rape in cyberspace. Hmm. It was t- a total, I mean, it was the sort of story that, you know, could only have existed back in the early days of the internet and when we were just starting to talk about there was just starting to be chat rooms and online experiences and this was like a this story really pushed the limits about whether or not a rape could occur if it was a, a virtual experience right. and it was a really incredible story I, I can't believe I had the balls to do it mm-hmm. really but I did I ran that so I would have gone for about 40 pages Jeez. and um, with some great illustrations I remember I got a phone call from Bruce Gingell do you know who he is? The uh, head, head honcho at Fairfax? No, no, Channel 9. Oh, okay. He's the guy. He was the, he's the father of Australian television. He was the first person to ever be on television in Australia. Uh-huh. And his son, Bruce Gingell, ran Channel 9 until quite recently. But anyway, he was like the biggest man in, in media in Australia at the time. Mm. He rang me. He just said, oh, I thought that was fantastic. Mm. So it certainly got attention. This is a broad question, but mm. um, what makes a great magazine story in your mind? Um, well, I think the thing about magazines, um, you have to remember what the word magazine means, and it's it basically, you know, it's a collection of departments, and they you know the word department, the magazine is a department store, basically, in, in, in French. Hmm. Um, and so what a magazine is, is its, I think its strength and its, um, its interest and its its um, what's the word? I'm trying to, I can't think of the right word. But you know what makes it vibrant and interesting is the mix. So you know you can have one fantastic story and a whole lot of shit, and the magazine fails. <laughs> but so what you want is you know a whole lot of fantastic things, and some of them will be long, and some will be short, and some will be funny, some will be serious, 
That's why magazines need a front of the book and a back of the book. And you know that each part of the book does different, has to do different things. And if you look at a good American magazine, that's what they all do. Mm. And uh, that was, you know, the sort of the, what how I learnt magazines, and I was very, very lucky to have learnt it in New York. It's the um, the, the great school, mm. and so that's what I tried to do with Good Weekend. So you'd always want to have, you know, a really interesting cover story, and it, you know, it might, one week it might be a really serious cover story, it might be a really amazing profile, or it might be a story about a terrible crime, or it might be, um, you know, I just can't even think now, you know. From my favourite stories were but from Good Weekend, but but you know it, it it it's it's the environment that you create in which that story exists, which is as important as the story itself. And one of the things that Good Weekend now I think you know does doesn't I think it will change now with the new editor because she's from New York and she'll mm. understand all this. Yeah. Um, is you've got to have a mix, and you've got to sort of understand that you know you're re- you know, when you've got two million readers or whatever it was. I think in my day we had nearly three million readers. That's a lot of different people, and not everybody's interested in everything. So you've got to try and appeal to you know a wide range of people, and a wide range of interests. And you've also got to recognise that we have different sides of the brain, and you know even we as individuals respond to different things differently. Yeah. Well, there's a clear link between your work with Ms. and um, Good Weekend to and Summer's reports. Mm-hmm. Maybe now would yes. be a good time to touch on that. Sure. How would you describe that to someone who'd not heard of it? Um, well, it's a, it's a, it's an online magazine, um, which is. Um, I mean, I, I, the way I describe it is, it's, it's a um, it's a digital version of a of a print magazine, and I I like to think of it as sort of combining the best of, say, Rolling Stone, the New Yorker, and and the old um, um, Esquire magazine. So it's sort of an old fashioned approach to journalism. So it's it's very. Um, I'm very keen on the writing. I'm very keen on on having very big, interesting features. I'm particularly interested in having good profiles. I don't think we have good profiles much in this country anymore. But we have a lot of profiles, but they're all very bland and anodyne, and nobody, people just want to puff people. They don't want to actually explore them or let us tell us anything about them. And I don't think I don't think a profile has to necessarily be a hatchet job, but it's got to it's got to bring the person out. You've got to learn something interesting about that person not just a catalogue of what they've done in their life Mm. and so I I pride myself on on doing good profiles and I write a lot of them myself Mm. um, because I well I I enjoy doing it and I I think I'm quite good at it I think you are too (laughs) thank you Um, but beyond that I mean I do think there are so many stories in this country that are just completely ignored by the rest of the media I mean there's just just drives me nuts there are so many I mean I feel I could almost run a, a daily publication which I couldn't because it would exhaust me but <laughs> but there is just so much happening that doesn't get talked about or let alone reported or explored and so what I've tried to do with with ASR is to have a broad palette of subjects that we're interested in but there are kind of a number of areas that I'm you know constantly drawn to and they include you know politics but things like um, you know in, environmental issues, race issues, sexual, sex and gender issues, um, um, so some sort of arts issues. But I'm just basically looking for technology, science, design, and, and it's all within an environment which is beautifully designed. We are very, very proud of our design and the fact that it looks so good and people comment on that, that it, it looks, because it's, it's not a website, it's designed as a PDF. Mm which has its limitations, um, but it, it looks fantastic. And um, a lot of people, you know, they read it on their iPad and they put it into iBooks or Kindle and just flip it. So it's you have the experience of, of actually reading a, a magazine and, and people enjoy that. A lot of people also print it out, put it in a binder and uh, read it on the plane, that kind mm. of thing, some of the older readers. Mm. Um, so that's... That's kind of what I try to do. It's got a great tagline. Remind me of the tagline. Uh, sane, factual, and relevant. That's great. I love it. <laughs> how, how long did you have that kind of on your your whiteboard, whether proverbial or actually written down as this is what I want it to be? And that just took me about thirty seconds. <laughs> I think I was reading the Australian one day. I said, "No, I'm, I'm, I'm everything. This isn't. I am sane. I am factual, and I'm relevant." Mm-hmm. And it was very much had the Australian in mind when I came up with that tagline. 
But yeah, no, people love it. Yeah. <laughs> what was the runway leading up to issue number one, which was a few years ago, 2012, I'm going to say? The first issue was was November, late November uh, 2012, mm-hmm. yes. Um, you, well, must, you must have had the idea, you know, rumbling around your mind for a while before you pulled the trigger and said... No. No? No, it happened very quickly. Mm. Um, and I mean, again, it's insane, uh, but, but this is the way things happen with me. I... Um, the basis was that I was I I was doing I proposed to the monthly magazine uh, that I do a profile of David Gonski because at the time the Gonski report had just come out and there were you know everybody's running around wearing these badges saying I give a Gonski and who in the hell was Gonski you know, or no one no one knew who this guy was because the only articles you ever saw about Gonski were in the business pages so there's never been as far as I could see a general profile of him. Mm-hmm. And so I proposed to the monthly that I that I do this profile, and, and they said yes. And I put a lot of work. I must have interviewed at least forty people, and you know, interviewed David, of course, and really put a lot of effort into it. And I was very, very pleased with it. And I had a very big dispute with the monthly about the editing of the piece, and uh, I withdrew it from publication because I couldn't, I didn't trust them to to not change it in ways that I completely disagreed with. Mm. So, uh, and then I, I asked Good Weekend if they wanted it and they didn't want it. So I thought, what am I going to do? I thought, fuck it, I'll publish it myself. Mm. And so I basically created the magazine. It probably took about, you know, a couple of weeks. All of the basic concepts of the magazine were built up around that idea of a basic cover story. And um, I was very, very lucky in that, you know, everybody that I asked was willing to work for nothing for that first issue. So we spent absolutely, the only, only cost of the first issue was the $70 that it cost to register the business name. <laughs> and everything else was, was free. And the, on goodwill. The rest on, was on goodwill. goodwill. Mm. And, and obviously you couldn't keep that up. But, but it was great because it, it, it gave me something to showcase. And people saw it and thought, wow, because this isn't just a website. It's not a website. It's a magazine. I keep insisting to people, it's a magazine. It's not a website. And... You know, I don't know how long I can sustain that because I think maybe it has to become a website. And I, I, have to, I say with some disappointment, but mm. it's very... Um, the, the problem with publishing as a PDF is it's not really searchable, it's not really shareable, and all of the things that you need to build audience and to get advertising, you can't really do with a PDF. So I'm, mm. I'm working with them, some guys at the moment to try and come up with a solution to that. But the, in terms of the content, um, I mean, that the, the, the concept of the content will, will stay the same. I mean, it will still be that kind of mix of great reporting. The other thing I should mention is that I'm, you know, I have a great American reporter. I have a great design writer from the UK. And um, I'm very keen to hire somebody in Hong Kong. So I like to have, um, you know, some international stuff too that's different from what anybody else's writing. And I'm very pleased. I mean, a lot of the stories that we ran, I mean, we're the first publication to run an article on the Tesla. Now, everybody writes about the Tesla. Yeah. Um, we had a big piece about Texas politics and Ted Cruz and all of that, you know, long before anyone here had heard of Ted Cruz. Um, and there have been a few other examples where we've been, you know, we wrote about the musical Hamilton before anyone had heard of it, and now everyone knows about Hamilton. Yeah. So I'm very proud of the way that we've been able to, you know, to be um, first with a lot of things. And my big, biggest frustration is, you know, I still meet people, even in the media, who've never heard of it. And that sort of drives me crazy. So outside of being editor and publisher of Ann Summers Reports, mm. you're also a freelance journalist, freelance writer, columnist? Well, I'm a columnist. I write a column for the Sydney Morning... Well, for Fairfax. I mean, I write it for the Sydney Morning Herald, but it also appears in the Brisbane Times, The Age, and God knows where else. Gamba mm-hmm. Times, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I now write for them every fortnight, which is great. It used to be once a month, so I've just had it increased... The frequency increase, which I'm very pleased about because of the money and because of the profile. Mm. Um I haven't been doing any free, other freelance work recently and I'm not intending to. Um, I don't really have time when I'm doing the magazine. So the magazine, I've suspended publication at the moment while I finish this book. Mm. And uh, I hope to be back um, back in back in business with the magazine in um, the second half of this year. 
Yeah, just on the book deadline, I, I remember emailing you a couple of weeks ago, but perhaps, and you had an autoresponder saying, <laughs> I'm writing a book, don't email me, if you need to get in touch, talk to my assistant. Like, I, I just loved like, the bluntness of that, like, yeah. I'm in, in deadline hell, I need to get this done. So. I know, well, I, I mean, it's, it's very, very tough. And it's very hard, I mean, it's just taking me a long time to pivot into that, you know, to the kind of isolation that you need to be able to write a book. I mean, because I'm used to constant activity and doing a huge amount of stuff and being on the go all the time and, and you can't write a book or the sort of book I'm trying to do anyway in in those circumstances. So I'm having to force myself to wind down and, and give everything else up and that's apart from, you know, apart from publish, publicising Damned Hills of God's Police, which is why I'm here in Brisbane. Mm. Um, and I've got quite a few writers' festivals and what have you that I'm going to be going to. So I can't lock myself away completely, but I am planning for all of May and all of June to, to disappear. Good luck. Yes. But just on money, um, yeah. the origins of Van Summers reports came from uh, essentially a killed story for the monthly, where mm. you withdrew it. So the monthly pay is a dollar a word, mm. or perhaps more for certain writers. Mm. Presumably that was a, quite a long piece of several thousand words. Mm. So you probably had in mind, I'm going to get paid this amount. And then you I didn't. took it away and you invested a lot of time and perhaps well, $70 in, in the, the oh. business name. But um, tell me about that uh, managing, uh, not working in a salaried sort of job. Mm. How's that been for you? Well, it's, it's, um, it would be completely impossible if I didn't have a partner who has a, a, a job and uh, is, is on a reasonable salary. And um, yeah, I'm very grateful uh, you know, over the time we've been together, it's sometimes been the other way around. I mean, I've had the job and he hasn't, so, you know, it's, it's that's fine. We, we're both okay with that. But if he didn't have that job, it would be very, very difficult because my only income at the moment is what I get from the Herald. And um, the magazine has cost me a lot of money. I have, I have put money into it, which, um, you know, I do hope I'll get back one day, but I can't be sure of that. Mm. Uh, it's been very hard to sustain the magazine um, because I don't really have enough money to hire people to help me do what needs to be done to get the money. You know, it's one of those vicious circles. I also run a series of events which are um, conversation events with people. You know, the first one was with Julia Gillard at Sydney Opera House and then I did, I did four or five last year. I think I've done seven altogether so far and I'm planning on another three in the second half of this year mm. and there the idea of them was to pay for the magazine it hasn't quite worked out that way unfortunately uh, but they've got to um, you know earn a bit of money just to, to help things keep going uh, but financially it's it's very tough in this country because we're a, such a small market you have an exceptional web presence your website is excellent thank perhaps you. the best i've seen by any australian writer oh really it covers okay, thank you. It covers your entire Okay. Uh, you know, everything that you do, it's wonderful. But um, you, you've become quite a brand in yourself. Mm. Ann Summers Reports, mm. uh, Ann Summers Conversations, I think, is your talk series. Yes. Um, was there hesitation in making yourself a brand, I suppose? Yes, there was. I mean, when, when I did created the magazine, I mean, the, the biggest problem was what to call it. And, uh, you know, so the actual magazine took about two weeks to create. That, that was the easy part. The hard part was what in the hell do we call it? Mm. And... It was kind of almost uh, out of desperation because I had to wanted to get it out. Um, I thought, well, if if I say, and and a lot of people have been saying to me, well, look, you know, we really want to know what you think about things. We really value your opinion. We like your name. So I thought, okay, I'll call it Anne Summers Reports, and reports is is a key word because I wanted people to know it is about it's journalism and it's reporting and it's it's not opinion. We have no opinion, or we've virt had virtually no opinion in, in, in ASR. It's been all um, um, reporting of one kind or another. Um, and I, it was a gamble, and I felt quite diffident about it, but I have to have, so I have had no pushback at all. I mean, I tend to refer to it as ASR now rather than and some reports, but... I've been quite amazed that no one said to me, oh, well, you're up yourself or you're water anchor or they don't seem to mind. Because, well, I guess it's the advantage of living in a, an age where branding is everything. People know what they're getting. 
Yeah, for sure. And so you don't have to, if, if it was called, you know, the spark or something, <laughs> there'd be another whole lot of steps you'd have to go through to explain what it is. Yeah, what, what was on the rejects pile of uh, names? Do you recall <laughs> anything that almost made it besides ASR? Nothing else came close. Well, no, but it's just too hard to come up with names. I mean, because when you think about what's out there, um, they're kind of all taken. Hmm. So, no, I don't. I don't recall. I mean, I must have had a short list of names, but I don't remember what they were now. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> How many words do you reckon you've written in your life? Oh. <laughs> Interesting exercise to add them all up. Who knows? I mean, it's eight books. It um, was four years of you know weekly journalism on the National Times, five years of daily journalism on the Financial Review. Um, I didn't write that much for Good Weekend. I used to write a bit, but not a lot. Um then there's, you know, what I've written for ASR, what I've written for the Herald. I mean, I've been a Herald columnist now for 16 years or something, or no longer, um, no, 20 years, I think. So, I don't know, a lot of words. Do you have a backlog of things that you hope one day to write yourself? Oh, yeah, I mean, this book that I'm doing is quite important. Uh, having kind of just wrestled with whether or not I'd do it or not, I've now decided I'd, I am... Not only am I going to do it, but I want to do it really well. Mm. And that's been, you know, I've put basically haven't done anything on it for two years while I've been doing ASR and all those other things because the two things are just so incompatible with each other. So, you know, the, the sort of mental energy you need to edit and run conversations and all that stuff and, you know, work with writers is very different from what you need to be able to get inside yourself and do your own book. So they're... I don't, I don't see how they can go together. Mm. Um, so I want to get this one done, and uh, and then we'll see. What's a good day for you when you're in writing mode? What do you hope to achieve? Well, that's actually a very good question because at the moment, when I'm still kind of getting back into it and and feeling quite despondent about my progress, um. I used to measure my progress in, in words written. I've always kept a diary of how many words I wrote every day. Really? And the last big... St- I've already written about 90,000 words of this book. 90,000? Yeah. It seems, uh, seems like you're going all right, let me just say. If you've got 90,000... Well, more. except that they're not necessarily the right 90,000. Gotcha. And, and um, this, I wrote these two years ago. So this, I'm going back now to work that I did two years ago. And, and it's, it's, I've, some of it's actually amazingly good, I, I think. So I'm <laughs> relieved. But it's not... You know, say the book is 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 you know this this long. It's maybe so it doesn't quite work yet. And I'm at the stage at the moment where what's more important than getting down, you know, a, a big number of words, is getting the thinking right and getting the um, working out what the story this book's trying to tell is and how I tell it. That's that's the big struggle for me. So. I could spend a whole day just thinking about it, and that's what I've been doing lately, and um, maybe reading a few other things to get some, you know, get my, spark my ideas. Um, so at this stage of what I'm doing, you know, just to, to, to my progress or what's a good day for me is, is thinking I've made progress in the conceptualization of what I'm trying to do. Hopefully, not too in the not too distant future, a good day for me will be writing two thousand words a day, mm-hmm. getting it done. Is there a time of day that you find you write better or think better? No, no. I um, I tend to work during the day, not rather than at night. I used to work at night when I was younger, but um, you know, I I do try and get up. Some days I try and get up early, say five o'clock, and do that kind of thing. But um, you know, after about 10 or 12 hours, I'm a bit buggered. And <laughs> really? What a surprise, 10 or 12 ten, hours. Tend to want to go and live on the television and watch. Man, if I get up at like 9am <laughs> and I've got some good work out by midday, I feel, almost feel like clocking off for the day. Like, as it gets closer towards night time. Yeah, I but you've got more time left than I have. That is true, and yet <laughs> I can't imagine working 10 hours or 12 hours a day on anything. But mm. I'm, perhaps I'm lazy. 
Oh well, it's a different, different approach. <laughs> you have a great constitution. I, I have, yes. Well, I'm very. I have been very fortunate in that respect. I'm just hope it lasts. Coming towards the end, mm. um, you mentioned reading something that you wrote two years ago and thinking that's pretty good, or oh, amazingly good, as you put it. Um, <laughs> how do you judge that your work is good or bad? What's what's the difference? Is it a, a, a reaction that you have to something on the page? Um, well, it's a good question because it probably, um, yeah, I guess it depends on whether or not it, it, it talks to you again. I mean, I had a very interesting experience yes, was yesterday, was that day? Yeah, yesterday. I noticed somebody had posted on Twitter an article of mine that I wrote a year ago about um, something that happened in Anzac Day back in the 80s about all these women uh, who marched on Anzac Day in Sydney and in Canberra in memory of all the women who'd been raped in all wars and caused a huge, as you can imagine, you know, the RSL and the police and the diggers are really thrilled about that. So I wrote this piece about it and... Um, I, mean, I was amazed to see this person had posted it yesterday. So I went and read it again. I thought, wow, this is... I was really pleased with it. I thought it was really good. So I posted it again myself. And it's had a huge response. Mm. Absolutely huge. On Facebook, like hundreds and hundreds of shares. Mm. Um, so I guess I guess it's good if it sort of speaks to you again, if it still, if, if it still engages you. And just rereading some of the stuff that I, for the current book I'm working on, rereading stuff that I wrote, say, um, two years ago, you know, actually some of it, I just, it's so wordy there. It's just, you know, it probably can be cut in half. Hmm. There is just too many words there. Um, but just every now and then I, I come across something and I think, oh, okay, that's, yeah, that's good. That's good. Are you good at editing your own work? Um... Okay, I'm not as good as I am at editing other people's. <laughs> I'm very, why, why is that? Very ruthless editor. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess um, it's always easier to see what's wrong with other people's work. It's always much easier. They didn't come out of your fingertips, so you're perhaps less uh, emotionally attached to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess you see it differently. I mean, you just see, okay, this could be really great if we do this, this, and this. Whereas with your own work, you're still like I mean, like, you know, like Baz Luhrmann says, you know, like you never finish your film; they just take it away from you. And I think it's a bit the same with books. You never actually finish the book. You know, you could still keep, you would still be doing things to it if they didn't take it away from you. So that's why it's a bit hard. I don't know. I'm just reading the Helen Garner book at the moment, book of essays, and uh, everywhere I look. Yes, it's really, really good. Um, and I haven't, you know, always liked all of Helen's books, but I'm really, really enjoying this. And and I was reading yesterday a section where she talks about she was she's spending time editing one of her books and talking about cutting stuff. And it it's um, she probably has a bit more time. I, mean, I I don't have a lot of time with mine because I'm trying to cram. I mean, I spent four years writing Damned Whores. And I spent, I think, Ducks on the Pond, I think I spent three years. And I'm now trying to do in a few months what I did in several years. So I'm on a very compressed time time, and probably totally unrealistic time, mm. time frame. Are you on a deadline with this? Well, I'm two years late with my deadline. <laughs> so, yes, you certainly are. Um, but, you know, I've prom- my publisher really wants to put it out for next May. So I'm trying very hard to make that happen well best of luck with that good good, good luck with your Brisbane event tonight (laughs) thank you very much and thanks for talking to me thank you it's been great thanks for listening to Penmanship and thank you to my guest Anne Summers you can find show notes to this episode and all previous episodes at penmanshippodcast.com if you'd like to contact me with praise, criticism, guest suggestions, you may do so via andrew at penmanshippodcast.com. You can also find the show on Twitter at penmanshipau and on Facebook. If you like the show, please share it with people in your life who love great Australian writing and please rate it on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. The theme music, as ever, is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. That's it for now. Until next time. Yeah.